This lecture is going to be over chapter six. It's going to be measurement of ionizing radiation. So we've already gotten used to the idea here that uh, we're going to be introducing uh, photons out of uh, a beam of radiation. And we've already gotten used to the idea that the photons are going to be causing certain types of reactions in the air. Uh, or whatever the medium happens to be. Uh, and we need to get an idea as to uh, how much, uh, how many electron uh, ionized pairs are being released. How do we measure that? So that we can get an idea as to what sort of beam we're dealing with here. So, in the early days here of uh, x-ray usage, the skin erythema was used as a measure of radiation effects. You need to, I mean, you know, it, you didn't really have much to go on, but you knew that if you pointed, uh, particularly these uh, rays that had uh, a lot of superficial dose, at the very least, you could see something change. You couldn't see what was going on inside the body. I mean, the bones weren't just changing immediately. So how do you see, how do you measure what it is that's going on? Well, one way to do that is to be able to see something. And if you point these rays at a person, you can see the reddening of the skin. So that's one way that you can measure what's going on with a beam of radiation. In the orthovoltage era, the skin was going to be the limiting organ to the delivered dose. Obviously, if you kept aiming the beam at somebody and the skin was sliding off or whatnot and not containing the organs uh, lying underneath, you had a major problem. So you were trying to figure out exactly how much you could deliver uh, without destroying the skin that was in the way. Now, uh, nowadays, this is no longer true. We, we know what the skin erythema reaction uh, should be in a lot of different cases because we built up a lot of data. But we also have more powerful accelerators. So uh, we're, we'll get into why it is that uh, skin sparing happens with these uh, mega voltage energies uh, a little bit later. So in 1928, the Rankin, uh, denoted by the capital letter R, was uh, adopted as the unit of measuring uh, X and gamma radiation exposure. Again, the Rankin is a unit of exposure. Uh, the quantity exposure is a measure of the ionization produced in air by the photons. So the exposure is defined as the change in the charge um, over uh, the change in the mass. Um, it's either you're we're either looking at positive charges or negative charges. We're not looking at a combination of both. Uh, and that's what's produced in air when all of the electrons liberated by photons in air of a certain mass are completely stopped in the air. So the uh, SI unit for exposure is going to be the Coulomb per kilogram. And the special unit, of course, of the Rankin is going to be 2.58 times 10 to the minus fourth uh, coulombs per kilogram in air. So uh, a free air ionization chamber. So what do we have going on here? We need to discuss something here uh, before we continue on much further, and it's electron equilibrium. So electron equilibrium in a volume uh, means that the ionization loss, in other words, the stuff that uh, where the electrons travel through here but aren't um, absorbed or counted in this particular volume. So the amount that you lose is the same as the amount that you gain. So with that with that in mind, we're going to uh, make the assumption here uh, that the amount that we lose is the amount that we gain. And we're going to say that, OK, uh, you know, anything gained is the same as anything lost. So we're just going to call it even. So what does this chamber look like? Well, you've got uh, an X-ray beam 
that's coming through here, you've got some sort of diaphragm here. It's going to be well away from the area that is uh, going to be examined. Uh, so far away, in fact, that uh, the electrons can't uh, make it uh, to whatever this distance happens to be. Not that we think they would, but uh, just in case. We also have guard wires here uh, surrounding this in order to try to make sure that the electric field that exists from this electrode to this electrode uh, is constant and is not bowing out. We're not seeing any sort of uh, uh, non-uniformity to that particular field. It's got a certain length here, L, um, and this beam is gonna have a certain cross-sectional area, A, which is denoted here. Um, and any time that an ionization occurs that we're going to have the electrons attracted to the positive part and the positive part attracted to the uh, negative electrometer. And what's gonna happen is that these electrons, when they go and hit, it's going to cause uh, basically a current in this particular system. And we're going to be able to count uh, how many times that goes on. So our exposure here is going to be uh, generated by this particular formula where we've got the uh, density of the material here in this particular volume. Uh, multiplied by the area, multiplied by the length here. So we've got the density, uh, the volume times the volume. So, um, and then we've got that uh, on the change in the charge on top, multiplied by our conversion factor here. So that gives us our exposure rate. So, uh, we're looking for accurate measurements uh, with a free air ionization chamber, and that's going to require considerable care. There are certain things that we're just going to have to take into consideration here. We're going to have to make corrections, corrections for air attenuation, uh, correction for recombination of ions, uh, correction for the effects of temperature, pressure, and humidity. Uh, on the density of the air because a lot of chambers are going to be open to the outside air and whatever's going on outside is going to affect what's going on in the air on the inside of the chamber. Uh, we're also going to be looking at correction for ionization produced by scattered uh, photons. So all of these corrections uh, are going to uh, be something we're going to have to add up or in this case multiply by in order to be able to get a more accurate reading. Uh, this, some of these conditions here are going to put uh, limitations on the design of these particular types of chambers. Um, as the photon energy increases, the range of the electrons liberated in air increases rapidly. So that's, that's something we're gonna have to take into consideration. They need to increase the separation of the plates to maintain electronic equilibrium. Uh, too large of a separation creates problems of non-uniform electric field and greater ion recombination because you are increasing the distance there, giving the ions a chance to recombine without them being counted. You've got an upper limit on the photon energy above which the Rankine cannot be accurately measured, and that limit occurs at about 3 MeV. So, most of the ionization produced in the cavity air arises from electrons liberated in the wall. So, knowing the volume or mass of the air inside the cavity will allow us to make uh, computations uh, of the charge per unit mass or the beam exposure at the center of the cavity. And so for this uh, particular thimble chamber that we're looking at, uh, originally here, we're taking a sphere. Uh, the concept is good to go from A to B to C. Uh, think of a sphere being irradiated where you have an air cavity here, you got an air shell out here, and all of this is being irradiated. So you've got stuff that's going across here. And this air cavity is in electronic equilibrium. The number of electrons that are coming in are gonna be the same as those going out. So what if we take this shell and we condense it into some sort of uh, 
cylinder or bow shaped thing like this thimble wall right here. Can we produce the same effect as what we see here? And the answer is yes. So what we have here uh, is an air cavity uh, here and we have the thimble wall that stretches around. We have a central electrode that goes through here and we have an insulator. So as the ionization occurs here in this particular air cavity, uh, we have the electrons that are gonna be attracted here to the electrode and then they're gonna go out to some sort of collection device. And that's the idea of the thimble chamber. You may have seen these in the clinic. Obviously it's shaped like a sewing thimble. And the inner surface of the thimble wall is coated by a special material to make it electrically conducting. And that forms one electrode. And the other electrode is going to be that rod of low atomic number material, graphite or aluminum, in the center of the thimble, but electrically insulated from it, this guy. So a uh, suitable voltage is going to be applied between the two electrodes in order to be able to give the um, ions that are produced, uh, some sort of way to come in and be collected. And the thimble chamber should be equivalent to a free air chamber, just like what was described. Um, the thimble wall there should be air equivalent so that what happens in the thimble wall uh, is the same as uh, what we see happening in, uh, in air. How do we do that? Well, the effective atomic number of the wall material and the central electrode should be such that the system as a whole behaves like a free air chamber. We, in other words, we can model what goes on in a free air chamber. Can we produce that same type of effect with this? And how do we do that? Well, what is most commonly used uh, for that wall material? We could look at either graphite, um, bakelite, or um, some sort of plastic coated on the inside uh, uh, of a conducting layer of graphite. Uh, an electrode is either graphite or aluminum. So how do we get the same effective atomic number That's, uh, so that it'll, the uh, photons are going to interact the same way? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to try to figure out here exactly what the average atomic number happens to be. And this is the formula we're going to use to do it. So we've got a one, a two, all the way up to n. They're fractional contributions of each element, the total number of electrons in the mixture. So if we examine air, you know, roughly 75.5% of air is going to be nitrogen, 23.2% is going to be oxygen, 1.3% is going to be argon. So the number of electrons per gram of air, so we've got Avogadro's number, uh, multiplied by Z and then divided by um, A sub W. And that's going to be multiplied by the fraction of the weight. So if we look at nitrogen, we've got Avogadro's number, we've got its um, atomic number, then we have the atomic weight. And we're going to multiply that by the percentage in the air, and we come up with this. Same goes for oxygen as well as argon. So we have all of these here. So now what we're going to do is we're going to uh, figure out here the number of electrons per gram of air. Uh, roughly here we're looking uh, 3.01 times 10 to the 23rd. So we're going to take uh, the number of electrons per gram of air here for nitrogen and take this as a percentage of the whole for air and we come up with 0 0.754 and that's the number that appears here. That will be multiplied by the uh, atomic number raised to the 2.94 power. We do the same thing for oxygen, we do the same thing for argon and we can pretty much leave it at that even though there may be other trace gases there those gases are not going to contribute significantly to what we're going to measure. So we take all of those factors, put them together here. You see the atomic numbers uh, for each particular element, raised to the power, and then raise it to the one divided by 2.94 power. And we come up with an atomic average atomic number in air of 7.67. Now, a thimble chamber could be used directly to measure exposure if it was air equivalent 
Its cavity volume was accurately known and its wall thickness was sufficient to produce electronic equilibrium. So under the above conditions, the exposure is going to be given by this particular formula. Uh, Q is going to be the ionization charge liberated in the cavity of this density and this volume. A is going to be a correction factor accounting for the attenuation in the wall. So this is going to be very much like the formula that we saw earlier for the, um, uh, for the air chamber. Um, we're just um, making some correction here for the attenuation. Now in practice, a chamber is calibrated um, against a free air chamber for x-rays uh, up to a few hundred kilovolts and against a standard cavity chamber for higher energies. Uh, because the chamber is not exactly air equivalent and cavity volume is not precisely known, uh, we have to go through and do this calibration. In other words, we compare it against something we know so that we have an idea as to how this chamber actually behaves. Uh, the chamber calibration factor provided by the standard laboratory uh, includes uh, the wall correction factor and other perturbation factors that they measure. And there's the, uh, uh, let's see, there, there are certain places in which you can send these chambers to be calibrated so you can get that information. And here we have the effect of wall thickness and how the chamber responds. So you can see here as the wall thickness increases, you can see we end up primarily uh, with a uh, diminished uh, chamber response, but something that is uh, somewhat gradual and linear in nature. And this actually, if, if I can exit out of this and go back here, I think I missed it. Let's try this again. There we go. So let's in here. All right. So the correction for zero wall thickness, in other words, as we're going through and we're doing this, we're assuming that the wall is uh, possesses a certain thickness. But for zero wall thickness, if we wanted a situation um, such as that, um, it's usually allowed for in the exposure calibration of the chamber is inherent in the calibration factor. So when the calibration factor is applied to the chamber reading, it converts the value into the true exposure in free air without the chamber. Uh, the exposure value thus obtained is free from the wall attenuation or the perturbating influence of the chamber, which is what we're attempting to describe here. All right, so what do we want in uh, chamber characteristics here? Uh, we're looking for, uh, we, we wanna be able to measure something without altering it. So we're looking for mini, minimal variation in sensitivity or exposure calibration factors with photon energies. Uh, we're looking for suitable volume uh, to allow expected range of exposures. Uh, we're looking for minimal variation in sensitivity with the direction of incident uh, radiation. Minimal stem leakage, and we'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, calibrated for exposure against a standard instrument for all radiation quantities of interest and minimal ion recombination loss. And that is referring to making sure that you have a voltage there that will be able to count all of the um, ions that are created without, um, without missing them. And usually this is the type of voltage we're gonna need in order to be able to do that. So what other types of chambers do we have out there? Well, we have a condenser chamber. Uh, then we've got a, uh, a metal shield surrounding it. We have an insulator. Um, we have air inside here, which has a certain positive charge. And we have air over here that exists where you've got a, a 
positive charge through this, but you have a negative charge around on the outside. So that chamber is initially fully charged. Um, when it is exposed to radiation, ions are produced in the air cavity and collected, leading to a reduction of charge on the electrodes. So if you don't have this thing hooked up, which is sort of the point here for the condenser chamber, if you don't have it hooked up to a device that's actually going to count the current, what you can do is you know how much charge that you had initially, and then when the reduction is finished, then you can go through and you can figure out how much charge you ended up with and therefore figure out what the exposure was. So it's defined as the voltage drop per Rankine, uh, inversely proportional to the air cavity, inversely proportional to the capacitance. Uh, the charge produced in the chamber volume V due to this exposure is going to be computed with this formula. Uh, the voltage drop off V over the chamber capacitance is going to be given with this. And the chamber sensitivity, if you took the voltage and divided it here by the exposure, uh, you can compute this. Uh, basically, um, you are making some substitutions here in order to be able to come up with this. All right, so here we have a farmer chamber, and this is something you will probably see uh, far more in the clinic uh, than some of these others. Um, you have an, uh, an electrode coming through here, uh, aluminum. You have a little bit of graphite here. You've got some housing uh, around that, and then you have PTCFE. Trust me, this is a better way to describe the insulator than the actual name of the material. And this is the description. This is what it looks like. Now, this chamber uh, it provided a stable and reliable secondary standard for X-rays and gamma rays for all energies within the therapeutic range. Uh, this chamber connected to a specific electrometer to measure the ionization charge, and it is known as the Baldwin Far Farmer Substandard Dosimeter. Uh, the thimble wall is made of pure graphite, and the central electrode is a pure aluminum, which we saw earlier. Uh, the insulator consists of, and this is why they called it uh, PTCFE, uh, polytrichloroethylene. Yeah, sure, that's it. Uh, the collecting volume, air cavity volume of the chamber is nominally about 0.6 cubic centimeters. So you got three electrodes in a well-guarded ion chamber. Uh, you've got the central electrode or the collector, you've got the thimble wall, and then you've got a guard electrode. Uh, the collector electrode is going to collect the ionization charge and deliver the current to a charge measuring device, an electrometer. The electrometer is provided with a dual polarity high voltage source. That's the thing that creates the voltage that's going to make sure that we collect as many of those electrons from the ion pairs as possible. Uh, the thimble is at ground potential and the guard is kept at the same potential as the collector. Uh, the guard electrode is going to serve two different purposes. It's going to prevent the leakage current from the high voltage electrode and it's going to define the ion collecting volume. So the energy spot response of the chamber, the response is almost constant from 0.3 uh, millimeters of copper half value layer upwards. Uh, and within about 4% from 0.05 uh, uh, millimeters of copper upward. So you can see here, it's almost a constant layer from this point on. And you can see it's within 4% of a, you know, roughly about here to over to here. You've got uh, characteristics of the farmer type chambers. You've got the chamber wall, the outer electrode, the central electrode, the guard electrode, uh, the chamber volume. The, uh, you've also got the energy dependence and you've got the stem effect. Now, um, some of this is a little bit uh, easier to see when it is written out. Um, 
here you've got the chamber wall described, you've got the outer electrode, you've got the central electrode, which was that aluminum rod. The outer electrode is the thimble wall or the inner surface of the thimble wall coated with a material. The guard electrode is a cylindrical conductor that wraps around the insulator surrounding the central electrode in the stem of the container. You've got the chamber uh, because the thimble is vented to the outside. The cavity volume determines the mass of air in the cavity and therefore the sensitivity of the chamber. Uh, you've also got energy dependence. Energy dependence uh, for an ion chamber depends on the composition and thickness of the wall material. And then you've got the stem effect. Uh, the stem effect is going to arise out of radiation induced signal in the chamber stem of the cable if exposed. Uh, the stem effect originating in the stem is directly related to the length of the unguarded stem. Uh, the amount of stem effect uh, is a function of the energy as well as the type of beam. Fully guarded farmer chamber, uh, farmer type chambers almost uh, have an immeasurable stem effect, but it does need to be checked. Generally it's checked when the chamber is oriented in two different positions and a number of points in the field are selected for measurements. Uh, correction factors are obtained as a function of the stem length exposed in the field relative to the length of the stem exposed during calibration. It arises out of the radiation induced signal in the chamber stem and the cable. Uh, the amount of stem effect is a function of the energy as well as the type of beam. It must be checked again periodically and its effect depends on the field size and it can be corrected for. Now, electrometers. Uh, the string electrometer is used together with the condenser type chamber. Uh, the chamber is fully charged in the electrometer. Uh, the shadow of the string is at uh, the fully charged position. Uh, the chamber is removed from the electrometer and exposed to radiation. And of course the ions collected reduce the charge and the chamber is placed back in the electrometer and the position of the string now moves away from the zero position. And depending on the reduction of the charge of the electrode. Now you have three different combinations here. Uh, the book actually does a pretty good description here of some of that where you have the end, I'm not gonna require you to know the uh, circuitry and things of that sort here. Um, you can notice here that this is the integrate mode, you've got the rate mode and you've got the direct exposure reading mode. And you can see differences here, like when you go to the rate mode as opposed to the integrate mode, you've got a capacitor or you know the amount of charge that's collected between a couple of plates is replaced with a resistor. Uh, over here, you've got uh, the capacitor comes back into play here with a direct exposure reading mode, uh, but here you have another resistor that's put in and of course this resistor is missing. So there are more elements to this. I'm not going to go into those, but do know here that the in the integrate mode, the charge Q collected by the ion chamber is deposited on the feedback capacitor right there. Uh, the voltage across C is read by voltmeter and we can figure that out. Uh, basically it's the measurement of the ionization charge. Now in the rate mode, the capacitor is gonna be replaced with a resistor and the irradiation of the chamber causes an ionization current to flow through the resistor generating a voltage across the resistance. Uh, the measurement of this voltage reflects the magnitude of the ionization current. So those are some of the basic things there that I want you to know about that. Uh, we do have some notes here regarding um, high open loop gain, high input impedance, uh, output voltage is dictated by the feedback element and other things like that. I think we can kind of go through this. A farmer type uh, 0 0.6 uh, CC ion chamber connected through a shielded cable to an electrometer. 
Both the chamber and the electrometer are calibrated so that the reading can be converted into exposure. The electrometer is connected to the chamber during the entire time of the exposure and the readout. Uh, unlike condenser chamber string electrometer in which the chamber is attached to the electrometer during reading, but detached during the exposure. Um, it can be used to measure the charge, uh, the integration mode, just like what we went over, um, or the current in the rate mode. And it can also, it has that third mode, the direct exposure reading, uh, where we have a direct meeting dosimeter inside. Uh, we also have here a cylindrical thimble, thimble chamber, and that's most often used for exposure calibration of radiation beams. Where the dose gradient across the chamber volume is minimal, it's uh, not suitable for surface dose measurements, and we'll get more into that a little bit later. Uh, high energy photon beams exhibit a dose buildup effect and a rapid increase of dose with depth in the first few millimeters. Uh, the chamber cavity must not significantly perturb the radiation field. We don't want to change it, we just want to see what it is. An extrapolation chamber. This is an ionization, ionization chamber used for measuring surface dose in an irradiated phantom. If we're interested in what the surface dose is, and in many cases we are, particularly when it comes to treating superficial uh, sites, generally with electrons, uh, we're going to need some way in order to be able to measure what's going on. Uh, so with the extrapolation chamber, the lower or the collecting electrode is a small coin shaped region surrounded by a guard ring. Let's see if we can find a picture of this because I can talk about it all day long, but it, unless you see it. So something like this where you can see the cross section of it. So you've got the incident radiation, you've got a guard ring here, you've got a thin foil upper electrode, and then you've got an electrode here, which is reading out to an electrometer. You've got some backscattering material here. Um, You've got an electrode spacing, and that can be varied by the micrometer that's over here. Uh, by measuring the ionization per unit volume as a function of electrode spacing, estimate the incident dose by extrapolating the ionization curves to zero uh, electrode spacing. Uh, it's used for special dosimetry, uh, measurement of dose in the superficial layers of a medium, dose, it's the dosimetry of electrons and beta particles. Uh, plane parallel chambers, I want to say we have, let's see if we can find that here. There we go. So this is in 6.7. So with the plane parallel chambers, these are very similar to the extrapolation chambers, except for the variable electrode spacing. Uh, the electrode spacing of the plane parallel chambers is small but fixed, so there's no micrometer to sit there and, and allow you to make an adjustment. A thin wall or window allows measurements practically at the surface of the phantom without significant wall attenuation. Uh, adding layers of phantom material on top of the chamber window is a possibility here. So you can study the variation in dose as a function of depth and at shallow depths where cylindrical chambers are unsuitable uh, and due to the large cavity volume. Uh, small electrode spacing in a plane a parallel chamber minimizes cavity perturbations in the radiation field. So commonly used plane uh, parallel chambers have a range of specific uh, specifications regarding uh, sensitive volume, uh, electrode spacing, uh, entrance window thickness and the width of the guard ring. So the specifications depend on their usage and desired accuracy. In other words, you can change a few things around if you need it in order to be able to measure what you need. So you can see the components of it here. So when it comes to ion collection, uh, as the voltage difference between the electrodes and the ion chamber of the ion chamber, uh, our exposed to radiation is increased, 
then the ionization current increases at first almost linearly and later, uh, later on more slowly. The ionization curve finally approaches a saturation value for the given exposure rate. Uh, the initial increase of ionization current with voltage is caused by incomplete ion collection at low voltages. In other words, you're not accelerating the charges to the collection quick enough. Uh, the negative and positive ions tend to recombine unless they're quickly separated. In other words, you got to give them something to run to. Uh, this recombination can be minimized by increasing the field strength. If the voltage is increased much beyond saturation, the ions accelerated by the electric field can gain enough energy to produce ionization by collision with gas molecules. Um, so that's going to result in a rapid multiplication of ions and the current once again becomes strongly dependent on the applied voltage and it should be used in the saturation region. The basics here is that you want to put it in a saturation region, but you really don't want it to uh, vary too much beyond that because if you don't apply enough voltage, you don't count enough. If you apply too much voltage, you're counting too much. So you kind of want the sweet spot here. The maximum field that can be applied to the chamber is limited by the onset of ionization by collision. Uh, depending on the chamber design and the ionization intensity, certain amounts of ionization loss by recombination can be expected. This can be true, especially at very high ionization intensity, like pulsed beams. Uh, significant loss of charge by recombination may occur even at the maximum possible chamber voltages. Uh, the recombination losses may have to be accepted and the correction applied for these losses. So the collection efficiency can be measured using a two voltage method in which one voltage is set at the operating voltage and the second voltage is about half its value. The recombination correction factor can be obtained from the ratio of the charges collected at the two voltages. The voltage on the chamber should be chosen so that the collection efficiency is at least 99%. So in other words, you're counting 99% of what's going on. So you've got the collection efficiency, the number of ions collected, and the number of produced. So if you've got continuous radiation, you might see something like this. If you've got pulsed radiation, you may see something like this. And then if you've got a pulsed scanning beam, you may see something like that. Chamber polarity effects. So the polarity effect is the charge collected by an ion, ion chamber uh, that changes in magnitude when the polarity of the collecting voltage is reversed. So there are many possible causes of such polarity effects. Uh, this effect can be minimized by taking the average of the two readings with reverse polarity. Uh, the polarity effect is more severe from for electron beams than for photon beams. Uh, the increase, uh, the effect increases with decreasing electron energy. The polarity effect is very much dependent on chamber design and irradiation conditions. Many of the polarity effects and stem leakage can be minimized in the design of the chamber and the associated circuitry. Recommended that the difference between the ionization currents measured at positive and negative po uh, polarizing potential should be less than 0.5% for any radiation beam quality. What are some other corrections as if we didn't have enough uh, that we need to examine here? We've got environmental conditions where the chamber calibration factor is, is stated under standard temperature and pressure, STP. In normal use, chamber is unsealed and communicates uh, to the outside atmosphere. In other words, what's in the outside atmosphere is what you're gonna find in the chamber. The density and the mass of air in the air cavity is affected by the temperature and pressure and therefore needs to be corrected. And that's the method right there that you use to be able to do that. So P is the pressure in millimeters of mercury and temperature is in degrees Celsius, adding 273 converts Celsius to absolute temperature in degrees of Kelvin. So we got an example here. We've got a chamber that was calibrated under standard conditions. Uh, when the chamber is used under the room conditions, this is what we find and this is the charge reading. So what is the corrected reading? So the corrected reading is 
uh, what we would normally expect uh, times 273 plus 25, because this is what we're seeing here. This is the standard temperature and pressure right here, uh, the standard temperature here. This is the standard pressure. This is the actual pressure of what we're getting. We go through and we do the multiplication. This is what we come up with, 3.07 times 10 to the minus eighth coulombs. So chambers calibrated under the uh, STP. Uh, when the chamber is used under the room conditions here and reads a charge of this, what is the corrected reading? And then you can see on the previous page exactly what that was. So finally, measurement of a Sorry, uh, for the measurement of exposure here, uh, you've got several different factors here that you're gonna be multiplying together. So this is your exposure. This is gonna be your chamber reading. This is the chamber exposure calibration factor. This is gonna be the pressure and temperature correction factor. This is gonna be the correction for stem leakage, whatever that may be. And this is going to be the correction factor for recombination loss multiplying all of those together and boom, you've got yourself the exposure.